Well, I think it was a big deal. When we came back from COVID, I think students had forgotten how to do school. And teachers have told me that the, the behavior issues in the classroom were just, they were just extreme, things they'd never really seen. Kids that had always been pretty orderly didn't really know how to do it because it had been almost a year and a half. It had been since March of 2020 for some of those kids to set foot in a classroom. That's a long time. So things were a little, little bit crazy. I think the body scanners have been great. We now have them in all middle and high schools. I really would like us to look at the implications of doing it in elementary schools because across the country, our elementary schools have been targets for some really serious events. So I would like for that to be a consideration. Um, so what, what are some of the other things? Um, I like the de-escalation things that are going on. Like at Hopewell High School when they started their Zen Den, which is a, a room where there's adults present, but kids can come and find a way to de-stress, talk to an adult. If they need to, they'll do a psychi or psychology referral or try to get them the, some support and help if they need it. And that's being duplicated in three other schools now. Um, so I think those kind of things and really addressing this, the uh, mental health and social needs of students and trying to make sure that they've got what they need um, I think that what people don't know that we already have been doing is every year we do a safety audit at all of our schools. It's part of our school improvement plan. And there's a secret document in there. It's not secret. I guess I would call it stealth. It's called the school safety plan. We don't release that to the public because we don't want the bad guys to know what's in that plan. But it might include things of like what kind of additional safety things are needed at the school. What kind of safety things exist? I mean, do you know if there's bulletproof glass at our schools? You wouldn't know, but there probably is. Um, you know, would you know about landscaping um, techniques or different things like that that might help deter issues or be a safety, you know, safety um, program at something that we would put in there? So la even landscaping can be a safety part of the safety program. But so we don't release that, that document, but it's done every year. And we have a safety team that does it. And, and we have a safety team that's in consultation with some of the big names. We've got a lot of big name banks and organizations around here that know a lot about security and safety that are working with us. The scanners didn't come like out of the blue. They were being used at the Panther Stadium. So we worked with our partners at the Panther Stadium and learned more about them. We went and toured it. We learned about them and how they could work. And we found school, a school in South Carolina in Spartanburg that was using them. We went, some of our staff went and toured it. <clears throat> so we're just doing that kind of stuff. I think we have to continue to be proactive. Things are going to continue to change. I would like to work more on elementary schools to really shore things up there. That's a big priority. And I want us to keep working on the mental health things with our students because we still have too many students that are really struggling with a lot of different issues. And then the last thing is, not the last thing, but one of the other big things is we've got to partner with this community. We have six police departments in the city of Charlotte. These problems bubble up in the community and come to our schools. So we need those law enforcement agencies and those organizations in our municipalities to really work with us on that. If anybody had the magic solution, I think we would all be doing it. But I will say that CMS has done so much now that people are coming to us to say, how did you do that? There was a, a, a stabbing death down at the coast in Onslow County. They came to us. What are you doing to, to help with that? Um, there was a shooting, I think, up in Conover, Catawba County. They came to us. What, what is it you're doing again? How did you implement that? So we're now actually being looked at as a role model for what we're doing with our safety. And I think the safety team that we have that's, like I said, it's a little stealth um, because we're not going to give the bad guys all of our, our, all of our details. We're not going to give the deets out on that stuff. So I think we're being looked at, but I think we have to just be open-minded and hire people that work for us, like, like Chief Mangum with our police department, that are open-minded. We have a, building, a person in building services that, isn't, that knows about how to make buildings safer. So if our buildings have to be safe, it's not just about what kids bring to school, it's what happens when they get to school. You know, we need to make sure that we have the right people to do maintenance. What if our door lock system fails? Then the school's not secure. You know, so do we have a system where if there's a door lock issue, that becomes the top priority, or drop everything, go fix that right now. So we have to just make sure all those kind of systems and process are in place, and they really are in place. I think it's tough. Um, na nationally, um, three to five years is the tenure for a superintendent, especially in large urban districts. We have put a lot of pressure on people, and there's probably been more resignations nationally in the past three years because of COVID and the strain and stress that that's put on just normal humans that are trying to do superhuman work in that environment. So I think that we have to really be careful about who we hire, um, 
you know, we had a situation a few years ago where I don't really feel like the search firm was operating with the highest integrity. Um, so I think that we need to maybe do that smaller. Um, I think we need to make sure that the public has helped us and informed us about what kind of profile that they want. I know kind of what I think is the, the top things, but I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm keeping that close to the vest because I'll share that in any time, but I, I really do want to hear what the public thinks. Um, I've heard a lot of different things and that's kind of interesting to me about what the public wants. Um, but I also think that there might be room for some things like a, a, an incentive to stay for a certain length of time. Like could you get a little bit of a bonus if you're here for five years? Um, those are things that are done in corporate America. Get the you know, signing bonuses, uh, retention bonuses, all those things happen. So I think that those are things that we need to have on the table as, as options and see where we go with it. I have a lot of them. I think one of the big issues for me is somebody that understands the urban suburban mix we have. I don't know what I would, I don't know how I could crystallize that into a question, but I would, I would maybe ask them, I don't know how, what is your, what would you, your number one priority or number one best practice in early literacy? Because early literacy is kind of my thing right now. I mean, so I talk about it all the time. So what would be your number one best practice in early literacy, K through three, to make sure that kids get what they need to get caught up on grade level? We first need to hire enough because when we don't have enough, we're putting a lot of strain on the existing um, teachers when they're having to cover extra classes and all that so you know the number of teachers coming through college right now is so far low so much lower than it's ever been historically so we got to do things to attract like our own CMS students we used to have a great program called teacher cadet and it was a senior a class for seniors it could be younger than that even now we, we do have the early college out at UNCC for education but teacher cadet was at every high school and the students would work with the teacher and they learned about education and they would go student teach at one of the local schools. My own daughter participated in it. And it made, a, it just, it opened a lot of uh, different ideas for her um, about what to do with her future. So I think that if we kind of promote that, we're good. I think we have to do a, a better job of recruiting from all of our local colleges. The bigger thing, I think the state of North Carolina changed a lot of its pathways to how teachers get licensure. And so people without education degrees need a pathway of how they can become a teacher. I mean, if you have a degree in chemistry, my gosh, we could use you as a teacher, but you need to be taught how to teach because there's a science behind teaching. But how can we make that pathway less cumbersome and make it so that it's easier for somebody that says, you know what, I just have a calling to work with kids, but my degree's in math. Lord, we would love to have you come, but let's teach you how to teach. And so what are like, what does a six month pathway look like that we could get that person involved so they could start teaching for our district? So the, the state has kind of given us a little bit of grief on that. They've changed it, made it much, used to be called an alternative pathway program. It's much more cumbersome now. So we need to do that. Now, how do we keep them once they get here? A lot of things. People talk about pay all the time, and I know that is an issue. We need to have a competitive pay in, in Mecklenburg County, especially because our cost of living is high. Affordable housing is an issue, a huge issue. Do we have housing that an average teacher can purchase in, in Mecklenburg County or apartments that an average teacher can rent? That's a problem. Not a CMS problem, but it's a problem for our community. But I think we need to do things, the culture from the top down. Whoever we do hire as a new superintendent needs to be somebody that's teacher friendly, that's teacher communicative. He has to be, he or she has to be able to communicate with the teachers at their level and also at every level, not just with the teachers. Um, but I think that there needs to be a culture of accountability, a culture of acceptance, a culture of respect. And I think that we, we are getting there, but we have some room to go. I think teachers right now feel kind of beat up and, not, and devalued. They've been through it. They've really been through it. COVID, they went from being superheroes to being villains, and that was not fair. I've seen the same thing, I'm a nurse. Nurses were superheroes at first and then we were villains because we weren't doing enough. And teachers went through the same. So we need to value our teachers, not just financially, but with just the positive energy and not the negativity in the community. So we've heard a lot about we're not doing anything to help kids, but that growth score says we are really trying hard because proficiency means you're already there. Growth means you came to us behind or you arrived behind, and we have to catch you up, which means we need, you need to grow more than a year. You might need to grow, you know, 
we have kindergartners that come to kindergarten and have never held a book before. They're already behind in early literacy. That's why early literacy is such a passion of mine. So we have to catch them up to their, to their peers that have been to preschool or pre-K or what, or just had a parent that sat and read with them every night. They need to learn how to hold scissors. All those kind of things they have to learn. So we have teachers that are superheroes that can take a child that is three years behind and catch them up two years. Well, guess what? That's still not a passing score because they're still one year behind. But she grew them two years. And if they have that same teacher the next year or a teacher that's equally as awesome and they grow them another two years the next year, they'll be caught up. They'll be caught up. So growth is enormously important. It measures how hard our teachers are working and, and, and not just our teachers but our administrators and our support staff, how hard are they working that they're really implementing best practice, that they're really being intentional about what they're doing with students, that we're doing these this curriculum with integrity but with flexibility at the schoolhouse level. It, it shows that that stuff is happening. So for us to have the highest growth in the five, that shows that CMS knows there's a problem and we're working hard to, to catch kids up. I think, I don't really try to lobby with parents over that. I think parents have to make the best decision for their student. And I have friends at homeschool. I have, I have friends and, and I know neighbors that go to charters. My husband's children went to charter. You know, I married a widower, so his children were already out of school when we got married, but they were in a charter school. Um, I think you have to look at what's best for your child. I want you to make an informed decision and not just a decision based on hearsay or public sentiment. So really get to know your local school Find out if your charter school offers what your child is going to need. Do they have special needs? Do they need speech therapy? Do they need, you know, some of the extra services and wraparound services that CMS offers? Do they need that? Do they need a school bus to help them? Can you transport them each way? Do they need free and reduced lunch support? Because most charter schools do not offer the federal free and reduced lunch program. But I think that you, each parent needs to make the decision that's right for their child. Even within CMS, there's a lot of choice and I support choice. You know, is a, is a magnet school better for your child? Is, there a, is, is your family really into languages? Maybe the World Language Immersion Program would be best for your child. Does your child already know how to build tinker toys and, and make amazing creations and you want them to have a STEM-focused environment? Then you might want to choose one of those, International Baccalaureate. We've got some great programs that really fit specific needs of specific families, and I think it's up to the family to make their best choice. We need to stay competitive, though, so that we're just as good.